Okay, let's go. Right, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is David McKerry, uh, representing IWFM UA region, uh, talking to you from Dubai. Uh, welcome to individuals who are mostly in the Middle East this afternoon, but quite a few we've seen from the logins uh, spreading the reach now as far as West Africa and the UK. So welcome to what is webinar four of the series that we've been producing. Uh, today's will be running as the normal uh, procedure we've had previously, uh, for approximately one hour, maybe just a bit shorter. Uh, and the topic today is fundamentally wrapped around sustainability. So what we're going to do is just to run through on the normal uh, protocols that we've had. Uh, so the first thing I'll be introducing you to is uh, the rest of the team. Uh, there's Sarah Montaz, who's going to be our moderator for today, and uh, three panelists drawn from uh, a great selection. We've had of people who have uh, volunteered and been volunteered to support us on this series and they're all from the uh, UAE region. Uh, the sponsors we have for, for today uh, are including Adib, Quality, BFM, Tuffwood and Mace, uh, who are the five current uh, sponsors for IWFM in the Middle East. And for those of you who are new to the Institute of Workplace and Facilities Management, um, our vision uh, as an institute is to be that pioneering workplace, an FM body uh, driving change for the future and to be a trusted voice uh, within the industry uh, working on the built environment. The mission for IWFM is very much about empowerment and enablement, uh, particularly of all of those who are struggling at the present in many economies to, to keep their jobs and to keep their organizations in tip-top condition. And therefore it's providing a platform through these webinars that people can actually create the conditions for the whole of the profession, whether you're an IWFM member or not. Okay, the strategic aims, there's five of them for IWFM, and uh, they are unchanged for those of you that listen to webinar number three. And it's to be that recognized voice, first choice destination, uh, fostering role uh, with those within the engaged community. And that's whether it's technical services, soft services, or even uh, as we've found increasingly, people who are in the support services for organizations of FM companies. Uh, as an individual, uh, I've been a member, first had contact since, uh, it was BIFM in 1993, and for those of you who are new to IWFM, uh, there's a whole wealth of information of shared knowledge in the background, and our appropriate capabilities uh, to fill these purposes and aspirations. So those are the five strategic aims. So back to post-COVID priorities and sustainability. Uh, this is the challenge for this afternoon, and the schedule will run through and say we'll have the participant introductions shortly from Sarah. Uh, there are three panel questions, uh, each followed by a straw poll. It's not like university challenge. There are no right and wrong answers or scoring. However, to keep the interest of the, uh, the panel up, uh, we won't know what your questions will be. So you'll see on your dashboard, although you can hear everything, the way, the way that you can communicate with uh, the production team is to use the chat box on your GoToWebinar dashboard in order to submit your questions, uh, which we will log and shuffle, and then Sarah gets to throw them uh, at the respective panelists, which they won't have seen before. Uh, and then we go on to the closing remarks. Uh, coming events, that'll be a slide covered off at the end. And then right at the very end, just before we reach five o'clock in golf time, uh, there'll be a short mini survey where we'd appreciate your um, involvement. So to introduce your moderator for the afternoon, Sarah Montaz, not star of stage and screen as yet, but becoming a well-recognized face within the UAE region. Uh, and we've been working on this project of getting webinars going for IWFM in the region uh, over the last six months. And I'll hand over to Sarah now to do the introductions to the rest of the team. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, David. Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to all you wonderful FM professionals across the world. It is my absolute pleasure to be with you today, hosting the fourth episode in the IWFM UAE webinar series. As David's mentioned, today's topic is about practical post-COVID priorities in sustainability. 
I'm thrilled to be joined with a superb team of panelists from different FM sectors. Um, we will be discussing and addressing how within their respective organizations and FM networks, the global pandemic and economic situation has affected and will be developing on sustainability within our industry, as well as daily business practices. So with that said, please allow me to introduce you to the esteemed panelists for today's discussion. Um, as always, we are colleagues, but more importantly, we are friends within the industry. So I'm very happy to be joined with the three fantastic gentlemen today. Firstly, please let me welcome Fahad Shihail. He is the group COO, sorry, group COO of BIA. Fahad is a pinnacle part of BIA's overwhelming growth and has been instrumental to BIA's commercial successes redefining the economics and recycling and implementing uh, technologies in waste collection that has again won BIA an award at the recent FM Middle East Awards. Congratulations on the award, Fahad, and welcome and thank you for coming to today's discussion. Moving on. Um, unfortunately, our scheduled speaker for today, Mohammed Al Sharaf, is unable to join us due to unforeseen circumstances. We wish him the very, very best, and I'm sure he'll catch up with the events in this recorded session. However, I am very pleased to welcome Andrew Law, who is the Technical Services Director at Tafawak FM, which is part of the Altizam Group. Andrew is a specialist in strategic technical services development, and he has had senior executive positions in the UK and also in the Middle East. A warm welcome, Andrew, and thanks for being with us today and stepping in on Mohammed's behalf. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for I do FM to um, for the invitation to be a panelist. Um, Mohammed's doing well. Uh, he would have liked to have been here, but he's advised that um, it's not possible. So I'm uh, a deputy on his behalf. Great. Thank you. Please send him our best wishes. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, lastly, I'm delighted to introduce another FM Middle East Award winner as our third panelist for today. Tariq Nizamuddin, who is the Senior Executive Director for Ijada's Commercial De um, Division. Tarek, as you all know, is a veteran in the industry with over 23 years experience in global corporations in both the public and private sectors. Uh, Tarek, congratulations on the numerous wins at the recent awards and a very warm welcome to today's discussion. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, thank you David. And thank you, uh, IWFM, for giving me this opportunity and looking forward for a uh, uh, fruitful uh, discussion. Great. That's great. Thank you, Tarek. So before we start, I'd like to remind the attendees, as David's just mentioned, this is a very interactive session, so please do get involved. As always, we'll be having a Q&A session at the end. So if you do wish to present a question to our panelists, please feel free to do so, stating your name and whereabouts in the world you're tuning in from. Um, we'll be standing by to receive your messages and time permitting, we'll try and answer as many as we can. In addition, um, as David has mentioned, after each of the discussion points, we'll be airing a straw poll to which there will be three possible options for you to choose from. Just select the answer that is best suited to you. Um, please bear in mind the, the poll is completely anonymous. Your details are not captured, so please feel free to participate and make your voice heard. Uh, ultimately, these webinar sessions are designed for you, the audience, so your input, feedback, and suggestions are very much welcomed and appreciated. And finally, before we get into the first discussion point, just a quick reminder that today's session will be recorded and will be released on the IWFM website in due course. So all the formalities are, are, are out the way, so let's get started. Um, the first discussion point is a pretty controversial one because I think sustainability has a different definition to quite a few people and organizations. So the first point really is, what does the term sustainability mean to you and your organization and, how, and has that changed since COVID-19? I'd like to start with Fahad, please. Yes, please. Thank you very much for giving me uh, the term. Uh, as you know, I'm working in uh, a waste management industry and uh, in this region and this uh, uh, in, in our region, it's very important to uh, uh, to have the sustainability. So uh, we work with the communities in UAE to uh, promote environmental responsible uh, responsible behavior. This is done through residential recycling education and awareness campaign for schools and uh, residents. 
uh, also we have some public RVM where we can uh, promote for uh, sustainability. In addition to that, we reached more than 20, uh, 250,000 uh, students and more than 600 teachers across all UAE, uh, learning and educating them uh, about the importance of uh, the uh, importance of uh, sustainability. This is this all initiative we are doing uh, in BIA uh, uh, take us to very important question that uh, uh, we have been uh, uh, in this industry and we are trying to promote and uh, to uh, 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 the sustainability and environment friendly behavior. Uh, so during COVID-19, we have been very active as we are a uh, part, uh, key partner of UAE National Disinfection Program. Uh, we did a lot of activities uh, uh, within uh, Emirates of Sharjah. Uh, this summarize uh, add a, add a, as a summarize of all uh, what I mentioned that COVID was a reminder that our environmental matters we cannot uh, just ignore a major problem related to the public health, which is very important, and the climate change. So uh, uh, with all of these activity we have done, uh, it is linked and make uh, the COVID-19 make us think more and more on how to uh, focus on sustainability. Great, that, that's interesting, Fahad, because you're talking about obviously the communities that you serve. Um, I'm interested yeah. to know what what has their response been um, for these new initiatives that that be has introduced. Yeah, uh, we have a great response since uh, uh, we are working directly with the communities. We have very great ex uh, response, uh, which lead to have even more uh, recycling material, even uh, the activities within the school. Uh, we have uh, uh, also a school award every year. And we can see a lot of participation uh, within the student, within the education community, which lead us to uh, to know that uh, this is important subject. It, it should be uh, uh, always uh, struggled or always mentioned in the uh, in the education system. Yes, very very valid point. Thank you very much for that, Fahad. I'd like to bring uh, Andrew in into the discussion, please. Yeah, I think uh, obviously sustainability, um, it's always been with us. It's grown sort of organically um, throughout the last few years. But ultimately, COVID has refocused our minds on what we're doing. I think one of the things that um, within the industry, there's a lot of talk at the moment about post-COVID. I think from Tafar work, we're very much in COVID. You know, uh, we've seen a slight growth in the UAE statistics over the last few weeks, I think as the borders have opened to, to travel, we've become exposed to people who have not got the same strict standards. But ultimately, sustainability for us from a COVID environment more focuses on what we do as a, as a company. Um, we try to how we the impact on our customers, the impact on our communities, the impact on our staff. Obviously, as, a, um, as an FM company, um, we're looking at our real estate assets. We're looking at saving costs, maintaining efficiency, trying to keep our high standards. Um, our FM contracts have changed standard-wise with regards to uh, delivery, particularly cleaning, obviously, during uh, COVID. But we're still introducing our uh, initiatives for reducing energy, reducing the use of potable water, recycling initiatives. Um, we don't do anything near uh, Fahad's organization, but obviously because of the large communities, I'm based on Reem Island here in our office, we look after City of Lights and um, uh, Marina Square. The significant quantities um, uh, of waste that we're managing on behalf of the uh, of the client. Um, some of the projects that we're looking at with regard to our, um, our uh, sustainability efforts now, we're looking at trying to eradicate single unit plastics from our business, but ultimately we're trying to pass this on to the communities that we're managing and looking after recycling programs. Um, we've got an active green procurement policy within the business as we're looking at tendering for our services and goods. 
we're looking at green initiatives, uh, particularly with things like uh, cleaning chemicals. You know, we're looking at now for um, our environmentally friendly, our pH neutral uh, chemicals that still provide the same protection of disinfection, etc. But it's less uh, less harmful. One of the uh, actually being in Marina Square, we're looking at things that don't uh, harm any marine life. You know, we've got an active uh, water line right around the uh, our, our office areas here. Um, we have a get wonky culture in the business. Uh, get wonky is um, a culture that's been defined uh, within LTZAM over the last two to three years. We have a get wonky ambassador, but this is about driving um, uh, our commitment uh, through uh, sustainability within our environments. Obviously, our own documentation is governed by an international standard and what we're trying to do now is procure services through SSPs and through goods and services to an international standard that fits in with corporate social responsibility and sustainability. Very impressive. Thank you, Andrew. I mean, you, you mentioned your clients there. Um, just want yeah. to ask you, what sort of aspect of sustainable solutions do you think are now most relevant to, to their needs, to your client needs? I think uh, energy is a big thing. Energy and uh, water usage, obviously, um, when you're looking at large scale communities, the biggest impact on them is service charges. So whilst we've got corporate social responsibility drives and, and guidelines that we're trying to foster and promote and enhance, we're also mindful that the communities in which people live cost more and more, our energy is costing more and more to far work uh, via Altizam is looking at procuring now green energy. We're part of um, uh, wider uh, realms within the business uh, to uh, both mergers and acquisitions into the green energy sector. But ultimately, we're trying to reduce service uh, charges to our end users. And we're using sustainability uh, through uh, water and energy recycling to try and make sure that we can promote this in an effective and efficient way and still deliver the cost savings to the communities. Superb. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. Let's uh, go over to Tarek and get, get his input here. Thank you, Sarah. Um, sustainability has been uh, under the spotlight over the past years. Uh, uh, we are focusing mainly on the commercial benefits. We had a lot of uh, case study research uh, uh, from all over the world. Um, Post-COVID, uh, sustainability is no longer a, an issue for tomorrow. Uh, it, it became a major consideration for today. Uh, uh, in, the, in the FM industry, uh, you've mentioned that uh, sustainability have different definitions across uh, across the industries and uh, a lot of uh, concepts. But in FM industry, uh, I see sustainability uh, is around three uh, dynamic fundamentals, uh, environment, uh, economy, and uh, social. And uh, meeting uh, those uh, uh, triple elements is the uh, bottom line that requires effective use of uh, available uh, technologies uh, and innovation. Uh, having the energy saving and uh, whatever the classic sustainability uh, uh, ideas is, is important, but uh, from FM perspective, uh, all the supporting services uh, offered by uh, uh, the FM service provider uh, shall improve the sustainability of the FM customers uh, in a, as communities, as uh, society that we, we are uh, working in. Uh, as an example, uh, the COVID had a huge impact on SMEs uh, and uh, it is part of our role uh, to support SMEs, which is part of the sustainability of, of the community. Uh, from operation perspective, we are blessed to work on uh, with uh, Nijada. We worked with uh, on a number of uh, facilities that are um, uh, Stidama certified or LEED Platinum certified, uh, which is already uh, was uh, a proactive approach uh, to to handle uh, uh, the sustainability requirement. And uh, when during the the, the pandemic we have uh, uh, we have noticed the fruits of uh, all the plans that we have implemented over the past years excellent it's interesting you spoke about the sort of holistic approach so I'm, I'm quite keen to ask you how do you think the FM providers can best deliver a comprehensive and holistic sustainable FM solution moving forward from COVID-19 
again, uh, I think you you know that uh, we as Ijada and myself are very keen in uh, on uh, technology implementations, and I think uh, uh, today the whole industry recognizes the importance of uh, introducing new technology and more dependency on uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in uh, uh, providing solutions that will. Uh, uh, have will offer sustainable solution, reduce the dependency on manpower, and provide uh, provide added value uh, to to the facilities. Which again will go back to the commercial benefits by reducing the uh, utility bill. Uh, have uh, BIA have uh, wonderful uh, initiatives for uh, waste management. All these technologies will form part of the future of uh, the sustainability of, of the communities. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Tarek. Um, I do believe it's time for the first straw poll. Right, so this is an opportunity for you, the audience, to get involved. Um, please read through this. I'll read through it with you now. You have three options for you to choose from. Um, the question is, in a COVID-challenged work environment, I believe sustainability has taken a new priority in the first option, much less important and a lower profile than before. Option two, very much the same as previously, no real change. And the last option is, it's now achieved much higher exposure and importance. So to the attendees, you're answering this on your own behalf. It's a personal response and please choose the option that best suits you. Um, we'll give you around about another 30 seconds or so. We'd like everyone to get involved because it's uh, very interesting to get the results of these polls. And actually, there's so many studies that go behind them, guys. I don't want you to think it's just part of our webinar. We actually take the data and we really read into it. And uh, you know, one of the things that we do is actually come up with subsequent topics for, for webinars. Um, so we really appreciate your involvement here. I think we're okay for time. It's been around about 30 seconds to a minute. Can we have a look at the um, the results? We actually published the results live. Wow, okay. So I suspected the, the third option to be the highest one. So there you go. It says it for itself. We've got Number three, 58%, um, and the first one, 26%, and people that are kind of in between, very much the same, no previous, no real change at 16%. Thank you guys for taking part in that. Interesting. Okay, so what we'll do then is go on to the next discussion point, if we can. While that slide's coming up, there might be a slight delay. Okay, there it is. Um, so question two for the panel, which international standards or national sustainable rating system do you consider are most relevant in GCC regional property portfolios? I'll start with Fahad. I know it's not directly related to your industry, but you know, because of the communities you serve, I'd be quite interested to see you know, what your response is here. Thank you, Sarah. As you stated, we are dealing with communities, so uh, we should have uh, a standard procedure for, for all of our operation. So this is number one. Number two, we are in a business or industry similar to uh, uh, the facility management, which require more manpower, which lead us to, uh, uh, to state that uh, without, uh, without uh, proper procedure, without a proper process, uh, will not have the uh, the best service this is number one and also will yeah. not achieve sustainability so uh, with all of these uh, definitely we have in BIA uh, since we have different function we have uh, collection business we have processing and recovery business uh, we have a treatment business and all of each function it has its own process so based on it, we, we are certified in each uh, function. We have like uh, ISO certificate for collection business. We have ISO certificate for uh, 
uh, health and safety. We have certificate also as well for the facility because we have different facility which uh, doing the uh, recovery and uh, recycling. From all of this, since we have a proper process with the COVID-19, we uh, should take the measurement of, uh, uh, of keeping our employee safe trace the bar to the higher level why because uh, they are dealing direct and they are uh, they are our uh, our asset yes we have some equipment but without those manpower uh, we cannot survive uh, after covid 19. so uh, we had taken very high uh, measurement uh, uh, to save our employee uh, our laborers uh, and the labor camp within uh, their working hour uh, and we updated uh, our uh, standard uh, in international uh, system and in, uh, our uh, standard in, uh, uh, to get a better process uh, uh, in the process uh, which is related to, to the each function. So this is in general what we have done uh, so far. Very interesting. I mean, you, you mentioned international standards. Um, I'm interested to know, coming from a waste management industry, do you think yeah. that international standards and best practices are now even more significant in your industry um, as we're going into this sort of so-called new normal? Um, and if so, which particular standards um, are the ones that you are adhering to? See, usually uh, we are following all the ISO certificate, which is related to the function. In addition to that, also we are part of uh, waste management uh, uh, charted uh, based in UK. Uh, all our staff they are certi uh, uh, certified uh, with this industry. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Fahad. Uh, let's go back over to Andrew for his thoughts, please. Okay. Um, as a company, I'm going to answer in um, a number of different ways. As a company, we're ISO accredited for 9001, 14001, and we've recently upgraded OHS 18001 for safety to ISO 45001. Our documentation and the control of what we do throughout Altizam, so that's Tafarwalk 360, Omnius uh, 800, is all governed by ISO. This is our back of house procedures. What we're trying to do more with our front of house uh, standards is using the GCC standardization organization, GSO. And this is mainly for goods and services, which are at the front end of our operation. Um, all of the, uh, the GCC countries are working together to try and generate these standards. There does need to be a local standard. You know, I first came to the Gulf in 2007. It's very difficult to offer working standards using uh, components they used in a European environment when the heat, the humidity, the working environment is totally different. It's totally different in every way, shape and form. So we try to go with the GSO. Um, this covers obviously things like uh, food, health, well-being, technical products. If you go on the uh, GSO website, there's 1900 pages of products. If you're looking for anything, if you're looking for um, uh, pens if you're looking for uh, but for us it's mainly things like air conditioning components technical components electrical components uh, the gso now covers a lot of these and the suppliers are becoming more and more integrated to deliver these services within uh, within the uae um, at the moment uh, they ramped up in february march for covid uh, related items so things like um, uh, chemicals for disinfectants um, uh, respiratory things so disposable masks and 95 masks all the things COVID became a GSO standard so rather than each country going their own they, they performed a common standard um, likewise with things like technical standards uh, what they're trying to do now is to deliver a technical standard within the GCC and this is more about protecting the consumer when you're going to buy something in the, in the GCC you should have the same protection rights as wherever you are so ultimately we're looking at uh, the GSO for our front and delivery which is more in line with the regional market but our back of house systems are all to an ISO standard which gives us um, integration and compliance with uh, all of the relevant ISOs for businesses. That's It's very interesting that you mentioned uh, a local standard because that's actually one of the things that I, I wanted to touch upon because you you spoke about the climate the asset type 
um, you know, yes. the, the age of the assets here. So, so you yeah. think it's viable causes to actually have a, a specific standard for the GCC? Yeah, I'll give you an example. I've worked on a project in Dubai Marina recently where we've got coils contaminated on a, a large chiller um, because it's it's salt laden uh, environment within Dubai Marina and the, the chiller that's been fitted doesn't have marine grade quality coils. If it had marine grade quality coils, it would have extended the life of the asset. And as Eltizam, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, enhancing the asset, protecting the asset, prolonging the life of the asset. And going back to what I'm saying about energy with our service charges, the longer we can make an asset last, the more beneficial financially it is to the end users, whether it be in a commercial tower for um, uh, office tenants, whether it be residential towers, whether it be communities. So for me, the um, when you're looking at a life expectancy, when you're looking at general components, I'm not talking about outdoor HVAC type components. Um, they're not designed to be working in 50 degrees C, 80% humidity, salt laden environments, dusty environments. It does reduce the life expectancy considerably. So for us, again, we're looking at our uh, procurement team, when they're looking within the marketplaces to replacing kit, um, we've recently carried out an exercise. I've, it's actually coming to my email inbox today, is a life cycle study for Marina Square. It's 12 years old now. And when you look at kit having a life expectancy of 20 to 25 years, it's not going to last 25 years on Ream Island. So we're monitoring it on a biannual basis on um, looking at the, uh, the life expectancy of the kit, any enhanced maintenance. So rather than go with OEM, which is quarterly maintenance, can we upgrade to monthly maintenance purely to extend the life of the asset? Very interesting. Thank you for that, Andrew. Let's bring Tarek back into the conversation. Uh, thanks, Sarah. I, I agree, totally agree with Andrew. You cannot have uh, the, the importance of having a local standard is crucial for uh, for sustainability and for any industry. It is uh, the, having the right uh, standard or the right best practice uh, is the one million dollar question. Uh, one of uh, the common mistakes that people do is uh, applying international standards in uh, locally, which is uh, uh, usually not applicable due to different reasons, different climate, different uh, uh, environment, uh, different type of users. Uh, for, to, uh, to, to answer the question about uh, which uh, sustainability rating system or standard, I'm a very big fan of uh, Abu Dhabi's Istidama uh, system. And uh, I was blessed to be part of the uh, initial discussion about it back in, in 2008, 2009. Uh, the, it's a beautiful system. It is uh, tailor-made to meet the local requirements. Uh, it covers it cover the whole life cycle of, uh, of uh, the facility from design stage up to uh, design, construction, uh, operation, uh, Complete, complete life cycle. Uh, where, where, whether this is applicable to other uh, GCC countries, uh, yes, it is. It could be applied for most of them, but not all of them. Of course, it will require uh, tailoring according to uh, uh, the specific uh, site that you are you are operating. In. Great. Thank, thanks, Terry. I just wanted to get your perspective in terms of, you know, uh, your staff and training and implementation of sustainable best practices. Has that changed for your workforce um, so, so as we're moving away from COVID? Of course, uh, you, the, the COVID, uh, the, the, uh, when, when the COVID started uh, and uh, the effect of the climate change, uh, uh, we have the uh, started to uh, to educate the team across the organization and uh, enable all levels and uh, roles to be able to reach into the sustainability toolbox uh, to strengthen their uh, operation uh, to to achieve uh, a broad uh, sustainability com uh, competency through the organization uh, any organization you need to bridge the gap and this should be across the board from, from the bottom to the top. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It's a very good point. Thank you for that, uh, Tarek. I think we're ready to go into our next straw poll question. 
So again, another opportunity for all the listeners in and the attendees to get involved. Um, Tarek's already spoken a little bit about Esti Dharma. So this question really is um, looking at it from the last 10 years or so, the green building rating system um, I have been, I have seen implemented most widely is um, Esti Dharma, which as Tarek mentioned is um, from Abu Dhabi, um, from the Urban Planning Council. And we have LEED, uh, as you all know, Leadership in Energy and Environment Design, which is a US-based standard or rating system from the Green Building Council. And we have BRIAM, which is a UK-based rating system, which is the Building Research Establishment Environmental and Assessment Method, which was previously BRE, uh, Building Research Establishment. I think that's actually how they started out, if I'm not mistaken. So again, to the attendees, you're going to be answering this from a personal perspective. In the last 10 years, the green building rating system I have seen implemented most widely is one of the three, Estidama, LEED or BRIAM. And I think we should be almost ready to publish those answers. Yes, not a surprise there. 40% um, Estidama lead is probably the most widely you know, used and recognized rating system, building rating system in the world. So that, that's uh, fair to see that's taken more than half of the people who have responded. Um, I'm actually surprised that anyone's followed the UK standard. I've not really seen that being implemented very much here in the UAE. So it's interesting to see 7% of you have been adhering to that. Thank you very much. Let's move on to our third discussion point, if we can, please. Fantastic. OK, so we'll start with uh, Fahad, if we can. Fahad, do you foresee sustainability and environmentalism achieving greater importance post the COVID-19 era? Yes, exactly, Sarah, because uh, after COVID-19, uh, there was a dramatically change in mind and thought in all communities and people. So now everybody is uh, uh, looking to have safe life, safe place everywhere. So I think uh, it will be much, much important than, uh, than uh, before. Okay, but, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's uh, as you know we've discussed today, and everybody's mentioned it. It's brought a, a real it's highlighted very much, particularly in our industry, um, the, the methods of FM solutions, because ultimately we're all looking to achieve sustainability. In terms of the future community engagement that you have um, from BIA, uh, how do you think the waste management solutions are going to have uh, impact or input there with the communities? I think uh, uh, nowadays uh, most of the people and most of the community, they depend on uh, digitalization it means that everything should be digital so our uh, way of communication before covid and uh, five years ago it was different uh, than now now we are uh, direct in touch with the community through the uh, social media through the uh, direct communication uh, even we started to do e-learning portal for uh, for the communities, and uh, they can have an access there, and to and to take even uh, uh, to have some uh, learning uh, uh, lesson there. So, I think from uh, my point of view, uh, uh, the waste management industry and the communication uh, with the environment and communication with the communities, it, it is much better now, it is much faster. Since now they trick the importance of uh, the sustainability and how to keep uh, environment safe. Uh, before I remember when we, when, we were, uh, when we were trying to reach uh, the, uh, the people, the community, it was very difficult to reach them. Why? Because they don't have that sense that yes this is important subject we need to look at it but nowadays anyone uh, talking about uh, uh, health safety sustainable sanitization a trick to their mind they want to understand how they can they how can they save their life their families 
So I, I think it's become uh, very crucial now and uh, uh, it is interesting that yes, COVID-19, it came with uh, something bad, but it came also with something good on the other hand. No, absolutely. And, and you're absolutely right. It's really, um, you know, the, the mindset of people has quite changed, particularly this year and over the past few months. Thank you very much for that, uh, Fahad. Um, Andrew, over to you. I, I think um, if you're looking at the impact, it's, it's good that you use the term environmentalism, not just sustainability. Um, obviously, COVID had a huge impact uh, on uh, the sustainable, the way we live and the environment. Um, you've only got to look at with three to four months absence of air travel. You look at the world maps on how pollution in cities, it's not just declined in some cases, it's pretty non-existent. You know, you've got places like Venice, which was heavily sea polluted. And because the tourism has, uh, has died for three to four months, they've now got fish swimming in the water. Again, it's clear, you can see the bottom. So I think it's a, a lifestyle change that was uh, that was needed and unfortunately it's took a global pandemic to open our eyes as to um, as to the impact that it's got on us and, and how long that will last i think that um, this term new normal is going to be around a long time i think going back to the way we were jumping on planes i know in 2007 when i was based in uh, in qatar i was flying throughout the gcc on a, a daily and a weekly basis here we are doing a, a webinar. Our whole business now is that even if I'm having a meeting in somebody with the next office and the next office, there's two GMs next to me, we do it through Teams. Um, our meeting rooms have been converted to um, into offices. I'm in the boardroom. It's the only office now, uh, the only meeting room in our office. It's totally changed the way we operate as a company. We're trying to push those uh, initiatives out into the uh, to the communities and the plants that we look after with um, sustainable initiatives. I talked before about energy saving, um, the, the other panelists are commenting on the communication with the end users, it's crucially important. In one of the projects where we put energy saving initiatives in three and a half thousand uh, units, apartments and commercial offices, um, we advised people we're saving energy, we're looking at reducing service charges, we explained what we were doing, but not necessarily how we were doing it. Um, once um, we'd made temperature changes to common areas to combat uh, some of the energy issues we wanted. We received four comments through our contact centre regarding it's warmer on the common areas. So four out of three and a half thousand people have accepted that, yeah, we do need to save energy. It's not just about saving costs. It's about uh, environmental issues, you know, particularly um, with our use of water. You know, it's a precious commodity, you know, and it's uh, it's being wasted on um, uh, on a lot of soft landscaping, which doesn't need to be there. You know, we're now looking at changing some of the soft landscaping into harder maintenance free landscaping. You know, th there is going to be a, a big change in the way the FM industry reacts. Uh, we're still, I said before, we're not post COVID, we're in COVID. I think um, uh, exercises like this, you know, with the IWFM and other local uh, organizations looking into the marketplace, looking at companies in comparative size to the, the companies you've got chatting today. We need to be drivers as well. We can't just sit there and let other people take the lead. You know, we've got to be active in these discussions, the feedback you're getting from your, um, from your, uh, 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 people watching it you know we need to be taking we need to listen uh, but ultimately um the we will come out of this stronger than before we were in but sustainability and environmentalism it needs to be at the forefront of what we do not a byproduct of what we do oh, absolutely and and you know andrew i'm glad you mentioned that because this is the reason why we do this you know it is for the industry it is for the for the fm professionals out there not just in the uae but across the world and we're here to exchange ideas and knowledge and you know, try and move forward together in the most positive form. Um, you mentioned the end user, Andrew. I'm, I'm quite yeah. keen to ask you in terms of the end user. Um, obviously, you said it's very important to get their buy-in for you know long-term sustainable sustainability in communities. What do you think yeah. is the best way to achieve that? Well, we, we we have campaigns. You know, we try to be uh, we try to interact, and obviously we have the benefits in some of the larger communities where our sister company 360 is managing the property in the communities. So Farwick is managing the facilities. So all under the LTSAM umbrella, we can combine to deliver these messages. Um, we have community knowledge sharing. So 
you know, where we've got things like City of Lights and Marina Square, where we've got initiatives that have worked well on one community, we will transmit this to another community. We use things like all the elevators now have got digital signboards. Um, we're using the digital signboards now to promote awareness of environmental and sustainable initiatives, energy and water usage. When we're looking at changing something that we do, which people have been used to, um, you know, obviously we've got a massive increase in cleaning activities since uh, since February. Um, even though some of the chemicals that have come onto the market give us eight-hour protection uh, from a sanitization and disinfection, um, the community still wants to see cleaners active and proactive around the areas. So we're still delivering 15-minute contact cleaning to high contact areas within there. But ultimately, we're using digital technology. We're using email shots, uh, SMS messaging. Um, so where we've got a particular campaign, we will drive out to a large community. If it's in isolation to a single building, we will target that building. So it's all through uh, digital mail. Uh, our marketing department put some very good documentation together. Plus we've tried to, with COVID, with people working from home, we've also used the same technology to look after their well-being. We, you know, we send them out uh, exercise, food and nutritional information. You know, It's very easy to be lazy when you're in the same place, not to be healthy, not to look after yourself. You know, And even with our own staff, working from home. We have regular contact uh, to engage with them to make sure they're, they're okay. But I sort of think, um, you know, looking at the uh, the target audience, what message do we want to deliver? How it's best to deliver this, the technology platform. But for us, you know, everybody uh, we win, whether they're commercial tenants or residential tenants, the digital signboards in the elevators is an ideal opportunity now for us to, uh, to broadcast what we're doing, why we're doing it, and to get their buy-in. And as I say, four feedback saying it's a bit warm in the common areas out of three and a half thousand units. Everybody has understood what we're trying to do and the end game that we're trying to achieve. Absolutely. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Tarek, if I can bring you back into the discussion and get your input, please. Uh, there is there is a general uh, consensus that uh, after the after COVID-19, uh, uh, we will live in a new normal. Uh, the type of new normal uh, we are heading into is still a big question mark. Uh, any company today should achieve a balance between what is good for the company and what is good for the environment. The COVID was a wake-up call for this. And uh, I believe that companies will be judged on how well they manage uh, this, ba this balance uh, uh, going forward. Um, the, the impact of... Uh, of COVID on, uh, as uh, Andrew mentioned, it is a uh, positive impact on the, uh, on, the, on the environment and on the, the sustainability. But I believe part of the new normal, we will be heading to, uh, companies will be heading to hot desking implementation, accompanied with uh, working from home, which was, which, uh, was proven that to be very successful. And uh, this is a pure, a small example how uh, this will help uh, uh, the environment, as this will uh, definitely will reduce the traffic and uh, um, uh, that heavily uh, consumes energy and burns uh, most of the world's uh, petroleum. Uh, so uh, this will reducing the transportation footprint, and uh, of course will help the environment. And uh, many many other practices will be uh, supporting the sustainability and. Uh, the ideas that we were trying to promote over the, the past few years. Um, I would like to go back to, to technologies, implementation of technologies, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, a lot of countries around the world are uh, have started uh, and uh, have a lot of successful implementation during the pandemic. They were very fast in doing it. Unfortunately, in GCC, we are still behind. We are still slow because because the, I believe that this requires initial investment, and due to uh, the economic situation, uh, companies are still not willing to to invest in those new ideas and new concepts. But uh, this is the future. Uh, this is where we are heading to, and this is what we need to start working. On. Before it's too yeah, late. Very, yeah. it, it's, it's interesting. I mean, we, we've had a lot of discussion, Tarek, based on, you know, the end user, the client side, their perspective, asset owner's perspective. 
I'm keen to find out from you, um, what, what do you think is the best way to engage with your staff, considering, you know, obviously such a huge company, from the grassroots level and above, the importance of delivering such sustainable FM services? And, and uh, another question, how, how pinnacle is that to Ijada's sustainability overall vision? Uh, which uh, it's a learning process, not only for our staff, also to our clients, to the end users. Everybody should be uh, on the same line. Everybody should understand the importance of sustainability. Uh, everybody should understand that we need to invest and uh, we need uh, uh, not only invest in money, I mean, invest in time, money, and uh, accepting new ideas. And uh, in order to achieve the goals that everybody is looking for, uh, the, the, the concept of that after COVID, we will go back to the way that we used to operate and we used to live is not valid. Uh, the world has changed. And uh, we, this is the fact that everybody should should be uh, should understand and should be prepared for it. Absolutely, it's funny. I we all use the term the new norm. I had uh, someone use the term the next norm, which I thought was very interesting. So I think yeah, we're going yeah. on to the next normal, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank thanks for that, Tarek. Let's go on to the. The last straw poll question, so another opportunity for our audience to get involved. And again, guys, you know, we're very interested to see your um, thoughts on this and get your feedback, because like I say, it really does help us with our work um, and our research. So the last one is, within my organization or network, I see new sustainability measures being implemented in service delivery processes equipment and also products actually we, we we're, we're keen we spoke about some products related to like cleaning products um first option is quickly readily efficiently with matching training option two we'd like to make improvements but capital is tight option three no spending allowed we're cutting back all round so again for the attendees you are answering these questions on your own behalf from your own experiences in relation to sustainability measures. So whatever is uh, any activities under service delivery processes, equipment and products. I'll read it one more time. First option, quickly, readily, efficiently with matching training. Option two, we'd like to make improvements, but capital is tight. And the last option, no spending allowed, we're cutting back all round. Okay, wonderful, I think we're, we're doing okay for time. Ah, interesting. So very we interesting. have. Yeah. It is very yeah. interesting. I was actually, I was actually thinking it's going to be the second and third option. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. So you, you've got 53% of the audience saying that it's quickly, readily, readily, and efficiently available, and they've had the matching training. So that's uh, impressive. Um, a, a bit more of an honest answer here, 42% people saying that, you know, their companies are looking to make improvements, but the capital is tight. And only 5% of listeners are saying that there's no spending allowed as they're cutting back on costs. Very interesting. Thank you very much for all of your responses. Um, what I'd like to do now, because we finished our three discussion points, if I can, is go into some of the questions um, that have come in from the audience. So I've got a few here. Um, I know David's been sieving through these questions as well. Um, we've had a question here from Yusuf. He's asking people's, well, his, his, his question is, people's behavior towards sustainability plays an important factor in the UAE. What are the strategies taken to enhance their contribution and initiatives in waste management? So let's uh, go over to Fahad as our waste management expert. He wants to know what are the strategies taken to enhance their contribution and initiatives? I think uh, the government of UAE and the Minister of, uh, Ministry of uh, Climate Change, uh, they are working uh, closely with all municipalities across United Arab Emirates to achieve that goal. Uh, they initiate a lot, a lot of initiatives and also with a partnership with the private sector. So if we say in uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, there is a Tadweer which is involved in uh, waste management uh, collection, who is in charge for all Abu Dhabi Emirates. 
they are working closely with their private uh, sector waste collectors uh, to do uh, to implement uh, uh, the, uh, the the country strategy so it is visible and you can see it uh, e even in dubai in dubai you can see a lot of places where you can do recycling there uh, also uh, through the messages through the social media here uh, we are in sharjah in sharjah we are uh, 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 the sole uh, service provider for all waste collection and we are heavily involved in all engagement with the communities so we can see uh, uh, great progress across all uh, all the emirates excellent thank you very much for that Fahad, I'm just looking through a couple of these questions that are coming in. Sorry, guys, just bear with me a second. I'm just trying to filter through what question I can ask because a lot of them we, we actually have covered uh, during the discussion. Um, Saif is asking, um, well, he's actually given us two questions here, but I'm going to read one of them out. What he's saying is most important stakeholders are the workers and the people who come into contact through workers post-COVID. And how can we overcome the challenge to motivate, engage, and have low attrition rates for employee and workers in a sustainable environment? Um, can I throw that one to to you, Andrew? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, obviously, COVID changed the way we work. Um, we were faced with uh, social distancing initially. Um, it meant that our front-end workers we needed to uh, put them into different accommodation. Um, so we looked at um, a number of different accommodations, more strategically located in some cases uh, to their project. We looked at the way they were eating. We looked at they were taking their breaks. We looked at, and now during the initial course of COVID, we were taking uh, advice from Dubai and Abu Dhabi municipalities regarding um, cleanliness and, and hygiene with, uh, to, to their standards, which was different in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. But what we were doing there was we were engaging with the uh, the, the front end workers. We were giving them uh, daily briefings. Certainly, when things change with regard to uh, cleansing activities, um, we started. Um, you were saying about engagement. We started a heroes campaign, and originally we had a monthly hero per project. And this is people who have gone above and beyond the call of duty. And eventually the Heroes campaign gathered momentum. We now have five per month. We have a weekly hero now, plus a monthly hero. Um, but with regard to some of the problems we faced, transportation, uh, we were down to 30% capacity on buses, moving our front-end workers to their projects, so we had to increase our transportation. We, um, so the, we our shift timings had to change. And again, we kept uh, our staff fully up to date as to what we were doing, why we were doing it, you know, it's not us or the clients that's demanding this. It's the the regulations that we were uh, into. Unfortunately, we did have um, COVID positive staff. These were taken in isolation. Uh, we also we looked after them with regard to their own. We supported them with our HR team, making sure that they understood why they were in isolation. Um, in a lot of cases, we had no symptoms. They were asymptomatic. They were COVID positive. In some cases, we did have people who had breathing and um, uh, think, um, um, temperature, but they were taken to medical facilities. So we tried our best to, we engaged with them fully. We looked at the, what, what is going to impact them. So obviously things like their sleeping accommodation, their transportation, their food, uh, we made sure that everybody knew at all stages uh, what we were doing, why we were doing it. Um, with regard to the support network that did this, our HR team did a fantastic job throughout the course of this. Um, uh, all of our, uh, the PROs, the, uh, the front of house HR team, the back of house HR team, they kept all of the staff, they had meetings with them, they kept them fully aware of when regulations were changing, what they were doing, why they were doing it, um, as well as the front end workers who were uh, keeping us active with our clients. The HR team needs a real, real pat on the back. You know, these are largely um, uh, people, people, people don't see them, they know what happens, they know yeah. visas appear, they know flight tickets appear once a year, but really these all of the HR team went above and beyond to make sure our front-end workers were fully protected, fully informed, fully trained as the regulations right. change throughout the course. That's wonderful, that's, that's ex excellent to hear. Thank you for that, Andrew. Um, we've got a few questions, guys. We've actually answered a lot of them in the discussion, but there's one question I'd like to put forward to, to Tariq, and it's again from, from Yusuf. He wants to know, um, 
UAE standards could be developed if sustainability is integrated into FM contracts, and that should be integrated into GCC reporting initiatives to forecast data and best practices in the GCC. Would you agree with that, Tarek? Definitely. I mentioned this in my uh, when I talked about about Istidama. Uh, the environment of uh, the GCC is uh, is uh, very similar, but. Uh, uh, I, what, what I said is that you don't have to copy and paste exactly the same standards and apply it in every single uh, city or community. Uh, the standard is there to, to have it uh, and you go and amend it according to the requirement of the community, the end users. Uh, each, each, uh, each community is, is unique. You have to address the requirement in a standard that is tailor made, made according to the requirement of your clients. No, absolutely. But, it would be yeah. a very uh, sorry. No, go ahead, Tarek. Yeah, but uh, but overall, one standard for the GCC is the right approach. Yes. Great, and, and also to see those initiatives be included in contracts, I think would be uh, would be a good yeah. move forward as well, right? It is already implemented. You can see it. You know, we're seeing it in most of the RFPs. Not not from now. Since I think since 2012, we started seeing uh, uh, those standards as part of the uh, of the RFP. Especially it started with big clients, but now it is implemented in most of the uh, FM tenders. Yes. Yeah, I, I think he meant as a as a standard for it to basically be implemented uh, across the board. So it's one of like the, 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 the key things that should be included in a contract. Thank you very much for that, Tariq. I, I appreciate your feedback. Um, and unfortunately, um, we've actually come to the end of our webinar session. Uh, we've run out of time, sadly. And as always, it's been an absolute pleasure hosting the, the webinars here for IWFM. I hope you have all enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, please be sure to join us for the next webinar series happening in September. David will be providing some upcoming dates for your diary shortly. Uh, just before he does, I'd like to sincerely thank all the attendees and participants around the world for tuning in today and taking part in the straw polls and the questions and answers session. Of course, a huge thank you to our brilliant panelists for sharing their expertise and their knowledge on such an important and significant subject considering the, these current times. Big thank you to the support team in the UK and also in the UAE, which of course, without these guys, these events would not be possible. And lastly, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors um, and use this opportunity to, to thank them. Um, Adip FM, Quality Refrigeration and Air Conditioning, BFM, Mace, Tafawak, who, which is an Altisam company. And on behalf of IWFM, um, extend our sincere thanks to you all. It's now sadly time for me to sign off. So I bid you all a farewell until the next time. Um, it's goodbye from me and I'm gonna be handing over to David to wrap things up. Lovely, thank you very much indeed, Sarah. Virtual hand clapping going all around from all the participants. Uh, just for your diaries whilst we've got your attention, please guys and girls. Uh, 21st to the 25th of September is the next event coming up, IWFM not mimicking the Democratic or the Republican parties is going for a virtual conference in September. So the dates have changed and it has been spread out a bit further, but it's the 21st to the 25th. So the next webinar we're probably gonna have yet to be confirmed. Number five will be on the 29th of September, so that uh, it'll be the week after the conference. Uh, then on the 12th of October, the IWFM Impact Awards and long look, possibly the 20th of October, We'll look at doing number six. Okay, those are the links. Uh, and uh, following up as you sign off from this, please do complete the questionnaire because your feedback is important. Uh, and the anything that you wish to send by email to IWFM or into the organisers, uh, particularly the panelists, I like to get your feedback. If you enjoyed it, if you want any ideas of the format, we've always tweaked something, at least one thing every time to respond to that, and particularly for the next topics. Procurement is probably going to be the one that gets it next time. Uh, I guess everybody's getting challenges with that. And, and there we go. Uh, would you suggest a panelist or topic? If you're listening and you want to stitch up your boss, by all means, send the email in. <laughs> it's a good time to go. But thanks again to all the three panelists. Special thanks to Sarah and thank you to you as the participants for joining in today. Much appreciated. 
Go safe, stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank, thank you. you.